Poverty reduction is the only solution to vote buying, says former resident electoral commissioner. And Wike cannot put the PDP at risk and is free to associate with the opposition, former PDP National Publicity Secretary Kola Logbodion says. Well, this is Fox Politics. I am Mary Anako. The immediate past resident electoral commissioner in River State, Oboe Fanga, has said only an improved economy can guarantee total eradication of vote buying in Nigeria. He described the menace as a societal problem and reflection of Nigeria's level of development, noting that introduction of technologies into the electoral system has made it difficult for politicians to rig elections through other means. Now, on how this can be achieved, Efanga stressed the use of information and communication. Well, joining us this evening is Oboe Efanga, uh, the immediate past resident electoral commissioner for River State. And also to be joining him on this conversation is Emmanuel Njoku. He's the director of Democracy and Governance Connected Development. Uh, Mr. Efanga, it's good to have you join us. Thank you very much. Um, so this this is um, irregular that we talk about every Thursday we talk about you know the civic space and how we can educate people more on some of the vices that are uh, we're dealing with in the electoral system. I'm so glad to have you join us. But let's start by educating people on what constitutes as vote buying. Um, a lot of people when we talk about vote buying just talk think of you know exchanging money at the polling units. But research has shown that vote buying sometimes starts even before the election in itself. Yes, vote buying would mean that a vote, a, a political party or candidates or political interests are using money and money's worth to influence the choices of the electorate in the election. And since uh, the election does not start and end at the polling unit on election day, it is a, a process. It means that vote buying could happen at any time during the electoral process. And it is for this reason that um, I had come up with this uh, idea of um, classifying vote buying uh, into various categories. I refer to the wholesale vote buying, also refer to the, the the middle men, middle middle persons, which could be middle men or mi middle men or middle women trading, and also the retail boat buying, which is the one most people seem to focus on, which is what happens on election day or very close to election day. Um, but boat buying could mean that uh, right from um, when people are aspiring for a position, even before they become candidates of the political parties. They would have gone around visiting uh, influential members of the society, trying to woo them to support them or to endorse them. And too often, this is not only limited to merely talking to the people to convince them to support these uh, um, aspirant and potential candidates or political parties. There's also some form of uh, horse trading that goes on then. So that also is part of wood buying, which is what I refer to as a wholesale wood buying. And that is why you would hear these uh, influential members of the society say they have endorsed a particular candidate and uh, then hope that those people who look up to them as leaders in that where they have influence would now vote in terms of how they have, who they have endorsed. Then um, at the level I refer to as a middleman trading is what many people observed in the last few months during the um, primaries of political parties where huge sums of money was said to have uh, been disbursed to the delegates of the political parties. That also is vote buying. Uh, but the one that a uh, lot of people are conversant with and they talk about so much is the one I call the retail vote buying, which is what happens uh, on election day or close to election day where the individual votes are 
is uh, given some form of gratification, usually cash, for them to vote in a particular way. Okay. Let's talk about how both connect. So I have also done some research that has said that there is a connection between vote buying and voter apathy. Um, but then one would think that if there is some monetary, you know, encouragement, people, you would get to see more people show up to the polling units as opposed to seeing less and less people come out to vote. But is there really any connection between those two? Well, maybe we should interrogate when we talk about uh, turnout at election. There needs to be uh, something to benchmark with. Mm. So if somebody says fewer people are coming out to vote now, then we need to know what they are benchmarking it with. And if people say more people are coming out to vote now, we also need to know what the benchmark is. I think that we first need to interrogate the number of registered voters in a particular, I mean, if you are looking at the entire country, mm -hmm. uh, then we look at uh, how many of those persons are actually uh, legitimately um, legitimate to be on the voters register before now. And we are doing a cleanup of, uh, INEC is doing a cleanup of the voters register. Maybe at the end of this exercise, we will know exactly how many people are registered to vote in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And then we can also look at various districts. And then apart from that, you also need to know how many people have collected their uh, permanent voters card and as such are eligible to vote on election day. Then we can now uh, calculate the turnout based on the number of people who have the PVC and could have voted in the election and how many people have actually voted. So when we do that, we can now say effectively whether more people, the percentage of persons who have uh, turned up to vote. Because before now, a lot of times people were looking at the percentage of votes cast in an election based on the total number of registered voters. But we also know that um, on the voters list are names of persons who are long dead and so shouldn't be countenance with in terms of uh, uh, turning up to vote. Mm. But until we have that clean uh, uh, record and also number of people who have actually collected the permanent voters card, then uh, we may not really have a good picture of the real percentage. Now, your question was a link between uh, vote buying and the number of people who turn up to vote. I, I think it would require more research to find out if more people have turned up to vote because there's gratification or uh, more people turn up to vote, vote when there was no gratification for them to do so. Okay. I think we're being joined now by um, Emmanuel Njoku, who is the Director of Democracy and Governance for Connected Development. Uh, Mr. Njoku, thank you very much for joining us. Yes, I can hear you. I can perfect. hear you. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, now, um, from, from the report that, um, or right, rather from the piece that um, the former REC put out on the Guardian newspaper, he talked about dealing with issues of poverty uh, in order to, for us to be able to even start solving the problem of, um, you know, vote buying. Uh, but let's start by looking at how this even started and who encouraged it and how we got here. Yeah, thank you for having me. And uh, this is uh, such a very good conversation coming at the right time, uh, given uh, the introduction to the Electoral Act and how um, INEC and the Electoral stakeholders, through all the commitments and engagement have, uh, with the new Electoral 2022, have given powers back to Nigerians and back to citizens. So this conversation is very important at a time that, like now, knowing in my mind from my experience in the field, that as we head to the 2023 general election, we'll be expecting, <laughs> sadly, to see a lot more of vote buying happening in the fields. Mm -hmm. Vote buying has been part of us, frankly, since 2000 and uh, since 1999, when the elections, when we, start, came, when we had this democracy, uh, it, it has become more like a culture. Uh, it, it has been happening. But then for every year, for every election cycle, the electoral stakeholders make efforts in amending the election and you know fixing the elections to make it better the vote buying in itself increases. You know, the cost and the, 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 the price, the rate of vote buying keeps increasing. I say this because, um, in, uh, I say this because uh, 
in the last election in Ekiti State and Oshun State, for once, we are seeing politicians trading votes and buying votes as high as 10,000 Naira. There is reason why this is happening, and the reason is simply so. The Electoral Act 2022 that has brought the use of the technology, the, the device, uh, BVAS, which allows for biometric verification before you are allowed to get accredited to vote, has completely taken powers out of the poll clerks. You know, before now, you know, before be, be, before now, these guys have a way of manipulating the process. But with the with the electronic device that we are using, Beavers, now you can no longer walk in with someone's PVC. Someone called John cannot walk in with uh, a Mary's phone. Somebody called uh, Stephanie's PVC and come to the polling unit, and the poll clerks will allow you just to vote. It, it will no longer happen. They need you. They need me. They need my biometrics for me to be able to vote. So what this simply means is the power is now in the hands of the people. But then, how much knowledge, how much exposure, how much do the people, the electorate, understand how much power that they have? Now, talking about hunger and poverty is a weapon. And these politicians understand this. They understand the weaponization of poverty and they are using it and they will use it more as well to the election in 2023. In the states and in Oshun states where I observed, I observed the elections, I saw clearly people being paid as high as 10,000 naira for elections. And frankly, from what we gathered, we understood that the money that these political um, uh, elites and political actors released the eve of that election was they were valuing votes at 20,000 naira per person. And this is very troubling. This is very sad. But then again, I always say this, and let me say this on your platform. While we try to critique and, and, and understand vote buying, I always tell people that vote buying, in a very funny way, is progress in our electoral pro process. Vote buying, in a funny way, in our electoral reforms, is a bit of progress. You know why I say this? I say this because elections generally, just hang on, I know you'll be wondering what am I saying. Elections generally, is more like a transaction. So you have politicians come to the people to tell the people, this is what I want to do for you. I want to do this, I want to do that. It's more like a transaction. And the people have to now buy into your manifesto and into your promises and now decide to give you vote. But our politicians have brought this thing down to an evil way of transaction, trading, giving you a particular amount for a particular vote. Now, what we need to make Nigerians understand is that politicians are coming to you because your vote is important. Your politicians are coming to you because your vote will count. And that is why they are buying the votes. Now, citizens need to move beyond that level of petty, petty evil transaction of 5,000 naira, 10,000 naira to start demanding more. There's a transaction going on. What are you asking for? So, uh, you should be asking for primary health, you should be asking uh, for primary health care centers in your communities. Exactly. So, so this is this is where should, I have an issue. Be. This is where I have an issue, and, I, and I'm going to put it to you, and of course the former rec. So we always say people should, people ought to. Uh, how many of these people know the consequences of their actions? Again, look, just as you said, there's poverty. He also put it in in his piece that poverty uh, is at the uh, you know at the base of all of this vote buying. But how many people know? that their poverty will continue to linger. Some people have no idea. It's an opportunity for them to grab onto, onto some money to feed their children. I mean, Professor uh, Lumumba had said that no matter how lyrical you wax to the average African, uh, when you're done speaking mm -hmm. English, he would ask you in the interim, what do we eat? So how much information is out there for the people, the commonest of people, to understand the consequences of these actions? So, so first of all, and that is why it's good that you are using your platform to have this conversation. Because, I mean, getting the people to understand the ills and evil of vote buying is not the job of just INX, uh, voter education uh, department. It is the job of the media, because the media has the reach to get down to, 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 to communities. It's the middle of print media, the radio media, the TV, everybody's job is job of civil society organization, it's job of traditional institutions, it's the job of religious institutions, it's the job of every person, political parties especially. But sadly, the political parties may not exactly do this because they are beneficiaries of this vote buying. And as we head to the 2023 election, let me tell you the evil of vote buying. So in the past, you hear politicians someone saying, I made you a governor, I made this person a governor, I contributed to making this person a president. You know, th that, in my view, has been very disrespectful to the citizen and to the electorate. Nobody makes anybody a governor. Those things have happened in the past because of the influence of vote buying and process of rigging elections. Going forward, 
if, if you notice across Nigeria and the people running for uh, presidential offices, you see they are seriously engaging one way or the other. Some are going back to ethnic uh, uh, ethnic uh, influence, some are going back to religious influence, some are going back. I mean, but they are all engaging because they have come to understand that in this election that is coming is going to be about the people. But the sad thing, like I've said, is now I I believe and I know because frankly some of these politicians who have always touted themselves to be popular and to be godfathers they are not really that popular as you were so for them to get themselves to win these elections I'm expecting and we are hearing already that there is going to be massive vote buying in the elections coming because frankly the electoral act has completely removed powers from the hands of even INEC officials who want to be who want to be corrupt and fraudulent frankly okay. they cannot do much anymore. Okay. So the power is in the hands of the people, but the politicians will come to them more, knowing that the people are poor. I was in an Russian state, in a Kitty state. Do you know what they were saying? The, 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 what they were saying was, vote and cook soup. Vote and make better soup. So they are flashing 10,000 naira in the faces of these very poor people. And frankly, in the rural communities, there are people that spend the whole year and they've never seen 10,000 naira once together as their wow. own money. And they are okay. putting it in their faces, telling them, vote and cook soup. So we are expecting that this is going to get worse, but this okay. sensitization, this awareness campaign has to be deepened to get people to understand the evil of selling their votes. Let me come back to you, Mr. Befanga. Uh, he's, he's, he's made a lot of references to what's happening today, yes. But then how, because I also know, I, I was in Anambra, I saw a lot of vote buying during that election. I covered, you know, the main town, Oka. Um, what do we do with the psyche of the average Nigerian who's used to, like he said, taking these monies to meet their immediate needs? Because you see, for them, that's the only opportunity they might get to get, you know, to place their hands on that kind of money. Um, how, where do we even start to, to change that mindset, that narrative? It's, enough to, it's not enough for us to say that, oh, well, there's the media. But then there are people who may not also have access to the media. So how do we do that? Well, um, let, let me uh, first re-emphasize um, re what um, uh, Mr. Njoku said, which is that vote buying has been happening now because the votes count now more than ever before. And I've stressed this over and again in my recent interviews, that is because the votes now count and people can only win on the basis of the votes cast and counted and declared. That is why the politicians are going after the voters to buy the votes. Now, we've all agreed that this is a, a societal malay and needs to be addressed. Uh, Mr. Njoku mentioned the responsibility of the mass media to that, and we cannot uh, overemphasize that. Now, there are other agencies uh, 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 in the society that can influence the activities and opinions and attitudes of citizens. And this includes the religious institutions and the traditional institutions. Although, sadly, too, some of the leaders of these institutions are also involved um, in, 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 this, in this practice. Remember when I talked about the wholesale a, a level of vote buying, that even the political parties, even the uh, uh, aspirants and candidates go canvassing support from these persons uh, that there is also some form of transaction that goes on at that level. But we cannot overemphasize the responsibility of these uh, agents in the society for, for, for positive change. The, the religious groups, the, the, the community groups, every level of association needs to talk about this. And of course, we need the mass media. Even the, the political parties themselves, it is in their best interest to speak against vote buying because you cannot tell if you're going to have more resources than the other political party to buy votes. You know the interesting thing, at the end of the, one, uh, 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 the most recent elections, a lot of times those who lose out in the election complain that why the other party won was because they, they, they were involved in vote buying. But the truth is that all of them were involved but somebody has outspent the other. Mm. So we cannot reduce our election to who spends more winning the election. So even the political parties, it is in their own best interest to also speak against vote buying and stop it so that at the end of the day, whoever emerges the winner in, in an election emerges on the, on the strength of 
the, the, the promises they make and what they are able to deliver to the people in terms of what we call the dividends of democracy. Not the, um, uh, Mr. Njoku said, in the recent elections, they paid as much as 10,000 Naira. And we know that this kind of 10,000 Naira won't even last more than a week. Even for the poorest of persons who collect the 10,000 Naira, even the person who hasn't seen 10,000 Naira in a whole year, because this comes cheap, they also spend it on all kinds of things that, give it, even if it is up to one month that they use in spending this. So after then, what happens? Mm -hmm. The people you are electing are going to be uh, in government for four years. So if you've taken care of one month out of four years, then you have uh, three years and um, 11 months to worry about your future. And these persons are going to mess it up because they've, they've already bought you uh, over. I, I, I want to talk about, you know, the again, because I, I picked so many things out of what you're saying. But I, I wonder why we don't question, you know, where these monies come from, where these monies that we're taking are coming from. A again, I wonder, INEC on its own cannot do all of the voter education. Political parties have, a res you know, also a responsibility. We, the media, have a responsibility. But I wonder, um, why are we not questioning how these monies show up in the first instance? Uh, other than just taking it and taking it and waiting. I mean, we saw what happened in all of the party primaries and how uh, allegedly it was a dollar rain of sorts. And nobody has questioned it. Nobody's really probed it. I mean, um, we heard that the EFCC was at most of these party primaries, but money still were exchanging hands. So again, does this mean that we, the people ourselves, have failed in our duties, ex especially civil society, in questioning where our money goes and how these monies just immediately surface on election day. Okay, so is this for me? Should I go on? Well, you can because you're civil society. Exactly. So, so the question is not even about civil society being able to probe where this money is coming from. So, you know, the, the theme of this conversation is um, vote buying, you know. So first, I would like to say, uh, using the term vote buying may even not capture the whole conversation. I rather prefer to call it vote shredding. I say this because we've gone to polling units, and you see citizens themselves are on the lookout for who will buy their votes. So, so, so the politicians, like I've said, are not just guilty. And we've done in-depth research on these issues, and this is all we found out. So the people, the citizens themselves, are also defrauded in the process. I've had conversations where politicians say when they come to a particular polling unit before the election will start, that they are making plans to pay as high as ten to 15,000 Naira or 20,000 Naira to the first 10 persons that will vote for them. The reason why they do this, these guys are just funny. The reason why they do this is to spread the message within that polling unit. So the first 10, 15 persons that collect the 15, 20,000 Naira goes around telling everybody, ah, but the XSX is paying 20,000 Naira out. So you see the citizens and the electorate now all queuing up expecting that they are going to collect 20,000 Naira. And this whole thing is a, bit, is a bit challenging. And as we're having this conversation, I want to call on the attention of the security personnel who are in this polling unit most of the time, who have the powers to make arrests. Because frankly, as civil society on election day, my duty is to simply observe and make a report. But then, for every polling unit that I've been to in Ekiti and Ocean State, using that as reference because it's the most recent election that Nigeria has ever had, every polling station I go to, I see at least four security personnel in this polling unit. And myself, I am not a security personnel, but for every polling unit I go to, it takes me less than it takes me less than 10 minutes for me to identify the person paying for these votes. And sometimes it's very coordinated. You see someone. So, so, more, and so I, I get I blame INEC. I blame INEC because in some cases, the secrecy of the ballot is not even assured, it's not guaranteed. So, you see, before an election, you see the, the, the people in the polling will push yourself so much that people are standing right in front of where 
the person who is supposed to make his vote picks up a ballot. So mm. as he's making his thumbprint, and these things are pretty easy, especially in elections where PDP and maybe APC are involved. Someone takes his hand to the top of the ballot paper. It's simple. He's going for APC. The person brings his hand. We all done. He's going to PDP. The person brings his hand out in the middle. He's going to Labour. These things are simple and it's easy to identify. Okay. Now, I, you I, I, I'm so sorry to talk over you, but let me come in quickly. You talk about the number of police officers at polling units. I've been at a polling unit before and I was trying to, as a, as a journalist covering it, and I saw open air vote buying. And as I was trying to record exactly. it, they, I, almost, I, I almost got mopped. Now, the police officers, this is a <laughs> conversation we've also had, is that they're not armed because it's against the law to carry arms at a polling unit. How do they effect these arrests if most of these people are maybe more in number as opposed to one or two police officers at a polling unit? No, no, no. So, but, but first of all, the police need to do this. Have, I mean, the last election in Ekiti State, it took EFCC officials wearing their red jackets coming from Abuja to be able to make arrests across the state. In our show state in Ekiti election, literally every polling unit there was vote by and there were police security personnel in this place. It is their duty to identify, and that's the point I was trying to make. I'm not an intelligence officer, but when I come to a polling unit, I identify either. So sometimes the vote, the, the vote buying doesn't happen in the polling unit. In some cases, when you vote, you go and meet the person who has identified that you voted for his party of choice, <laughs> and he'll give you a tally with which you now leave the polling unit and go to some other place, present the tally, and you are paid. But my point is, there are security personnel in this polling unit, and allegations, and even conversations we've had, and we've been able to find out that in some cases, even the politicians, they have a budget for the police personnel that come to the police. So the whole process, the whole vote buying thing starts first of all from delegate uh, ward election down to the primary election they do in the states, how this part uh, candidates emerge, down to the police. Literally everybody, politicians try to buy up everybody. And what I'm saying, like in most cases, even the police personnel who are in the police, who have they even alleged that there is a budget mostly for them so that they can turn the other way and have these guys do what they want to do. Because frankly, all the political parties in the last elections that I've observed, they all do vote by him like, 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 like the uh, former Rex. Eh? Okay. But is who will outbuy who? <laughs> who outspends who? <laughs> okay, back to you, Mr. Fanga. He's, he's, he's saying he's, he blames um, I think I think I've had this conversation many times with INEC officials about security operatives at polling units, what they're capable of doing and what they're not capable of doing. Because I've seen police officers stand by and do nothing. And this thing's happening, you know, in the clear. So what does INEC do in this case? Because INEC is not a law enforcement, but then he's saying INEC is to be blamed. Okay, so um, there are various ways to look at this. <clears throat> I'm not holding brief for the security agencies, but let's also look at practical scenarios. You, find, you go to a polling unit in a community where we've established that we've passed the stage of political parties trying to woo, uh, trying to buy uh, the votes. We've reached a stage that even the voters want their votes to be bought. So you now have an understanding between the voter and the political parties. Okay, it now becomes difficult for you to break that chain. Now, if you have a security agent at that polling unit, while it is important to stop the vote buying and possibly arrest people at that point, I imagine that they will also have to weigh the possible consequences of an attempt to make an arrest at that point that it could lead to a breakdown of law and order that would even mar the entire election. It could disrupt election in that polling unit. So would you, in the attempt to make an arrest there, just to make a point that you've arrested someone, now ruin the, uh, uh, risk the possibility of election being, uh, uh, being a, uh, a confusion in that uh, uh, polling unit, and then election is disrupted there? Now, the other point he made, um, Mr. Njoku made about um, the secrecy of the votes. We have the cubicle that has opportunity for you to vote in such a way that somebody does not see how you voted. But when somebody himself or herself is determined to prove that he, he or she has voted in a particular way, then the person will do that. So you find a situation where even if the secrecy is, is, is provided, the person finishes some printing on the ballot paper. Now, remember what we have is open secret balloting, which means that 
you make the you mark the ballot in secret and come and drop the ballot in the open the ballot box mm -hmm. must be kept in a place that everybody sees okay so these voters now in coming to drop the ballot paper in the ballot box consciously does as if he's trying to fold this paper in such a way that he or she wants how he has voted to be seen mm. by those who are going to pay for the vote. So you find a situation where you have a willing vote, a, a willing buyer and a willing seller. It now becomes difficult for a third party to break that uh, that chain. The 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 the, ar the arrest that we talked about that uh, the EFCC made. Uh, even Mr. Joko admitted it wasn't within the polling unit, uh, the, the, the vicinity. But outside there, they were able to identify locations where money was being exchanged, and it raised um, uh, um, it raised concerns about what the money was being exchanged for. And then those persons were arrested. It is further investigation that would lead them to identify that this uh, uh, transaction was related to the election. But at the polling unit. The, the electoral official at that point, what is most important for him or her is to allow anybody who is uh, uh, registered to vote and has come with his or her permanent voter's card to be accredited, given a ballot paper to vote. And when he, has, he or she has finished voting, at the end of voting, the votes are counted and the results um, are declared based on the votes that are counted. If you expect that we will prioritize the arrest of willing buyers and willing uh, uh, sellers as, a as opposed to uh, paying attention to people voting and the votes being counted, then it means that we would have wasted the time of the voting because the election would be disrupted. And mm. at the end of the day, we won't even have the votes to count. Well, this is a conversation that has to be continuously had, but unfortunately, time is no longer on our side. But I want to say thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Boyfanga is the immediate past resident electoral commissioner uh, in River State. And Jocko Imano is the director of Democracy and Governance, Connected Developments, which is also called CODE. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you all for staying with us. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll continue our discussion on the PDP Wike saga. Kola Logbodino of the People's Democratic Party, former National Publicity Secretary, has dismissed concerns that Governor Yesun Wike of River State may form an alliance that might be detrimental to the party's chances next year. Stay with us. It's still plus politics now. Kola Lobodino of the People's Democratic Party, he was the former National Publicity Secretary, has dismissed concerns that Governor Yeso Mwiki of River State may form an alliance detrimental to the party's chances during next year's presidential election. He also said the governor was at liberty to associate with politicians from other camps, such as with, within, uh, which was within his right. Now, Joining us to discuss more on this uh, drag within the PDP is Diron Odeyemi. He is a former Deputy National Publicity Secretary of the People's Democratic Party. Mr. Odeyemi, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be with you this evening. Great. Uh, there have been so many conversations around the situation between Governor Wike and the presidential flag bearer of your party. There have also been concerns as to his hobnobbing, I use that word loosely here, uh, with other members of other political parties, especially the Labour Party, uh, being that there are certain demands that were made, um, allegedly from his um, group that has not necessarily uh, been met by the party. But let me ask you as an insider, um, what is the party doing to reconcile Governor Wike and, of course, uh, the presidential flag wearer, and the party chairman? I would have thought this, this question could be answered by the... Uh... Once again, joining us is Deron Deyemi. Now, Mr. Deyemi, you were about to answer my question before we lost that connection. Yes, I, I was saying that uh, the NWC member will be able to answer what exactly they are doing towards the consolidating you know, the crisis that we find ourselves. And, and I want to say clearly yeah. that the issues are damn too simple. The party uh, in its wisdom 
have given the presidential candidature to Atiku and the vice presidential to Okowa. In the process of reconciling with Governor Wiki and his allies, such as the uh, um, uh, former governor of the case, I identify as uh, former governor of the state, Miku and others, there was a particular demand which is legitimate and logical. And this is that if we have the presidential candidate from the north, and we have the chairman of the party from the north, the chairman of the BOP from the north, and the chairman of the government government from the north, then the chairman should be able to fulfill his promise and be a man of honor by resigning from that position and give it to somebody from the south so that there will be equality there will be justice and there will be fear in the party, which is enshrined in our constitution. But if and if the party in its wisdom are not ready to meet the demands of the Governor Wiki, it is now left for the BOC and other leaders of the party to see how we can move forward. How is it but possible? If we how how possible? And we are not in crisis. I will not be a party to it. Exactly. Because I, if I would, we are to be frantic with ourselves, if we are to be sincere, we are in deep crisis. Exactly. I was about to say that how do you move on if, you know, your house is on fire? Again, the 2023 elections, as we all know, is going to be a very fiercely contested one. And if this early in the day, the PDP seems to have its house uh, not in order, and this drag and the fight is becoming a bit more public than it should be. Um, what's, the, what's the guarantee that the PDP will carry the day or you even stand a chance come 2023? Again, I'd like to put it out there. This is the second time in a very short while that, just to, that the PDP is having another go at its leadership. And why is that? I remember how second this was you know, kicked out of the party. Here we are again in a very short space and everybody's asking for you to step down. Why can't these things be clearly sought out or sorted out, I beg your pardon, in the best interest of the party as opposed to personal, um, personal needs? I didn't really catch the question, please. The question is, what's the guarantee that the PDP can stand a chance against all of its opponents come 2023 if this early in the day there's this much fire on the mountain? Oh, once again, I think that we've lost Duran Day and me on. Uh, I think that we are having a little connection problem there with him. Uh, we will go on a quick break, and when we come back, we will be wrapping things up finally on the show. Stay with us. Well, that's it on the show tonight, but before we go, here's my take. Now, the past is supposed to inform our present and prepare us for the future. Yet, the stagnation of our development is worsening national circumstances. Uh, it shows that we're still doing the same thing, expecting different results. And that, for me, is a definition of insanity. Now, too often, so many of you, you know, have sold your votes for short-term gains. The money that is paid for that vote is not a deposit for your future prosperity. Because short-term thinking like that would never solve any of our problems. Taking the money and not voting at all is not even better. But our greatest weapon against making the same mistakes in the past um, is knowledge. Learn all that you can about these candidates. I always say this. They can tell you whatever you want to hear, but do your own digging. You will be making a more informed decision. I am Mary Anna Cohn. Have a good evening. <laughs>